Hello and welcome to our Q&A session about the GT20 Gyrotrack, a gyrocopter-helicopter hybrid. As this kind of UAV has never been done before, um, we want to get some more details about it today. And in order to do this, I invited a real expert, a aerospace engineer and former jet pilot, our CEO, Joe Shamoon. Hi, Hi. welcome. Hi. Well, here it is, GT20 Gyrotrack. 1.55 meters long, 7.5 kilogram of weight, helicopter gyrocopter hybrid. I think everyone has an idea what a, what a helicopter is, but a gyrocopter, can you explain something about uh, this kind of aircraft? Yeah, so a gyrocopter is actually a very old design in the aviation industry. It's about uh, 100 years old. Um, I guess it was 1920 when uh, the first patent about gyrocopter technology was uh, released. And the basic principle of a gyrocopter that is that it has a passive driven main rotor disc. And this passive driven main rotor disc is uh, creating the lift. This makes gyrocopters in principle the safest uh, aviation vehicles uh, in the history of uh, aviation. We basically um, used uh, this principle as uh, uh, the main anchor of uh, our design uh, where we started from. So we are using the gyrocopter principle in order to save energy, uh, to create a very safe uh, flight envelope. Um, and um, in order to complete the aircraft, we had to add uh, the hovering capability uh, of uh, the gyrocopter. So it's a kind of VTOL gyrocopter, right? Yes, it's a, it's a gyrocopter that is enabled uh, to take off and land at any time. Um, we basically um, created it by adding a main gearbox um, on the lower level of uh, the drivetrain um, and a vertical main hub motor that uh, puts energy into the gearbox. And um, in hovering, this means um, in, a, in a flight situation where I have zero speed forward, it operates like a helicopter with one big difference, it has no tail rotor. Right. Um, the um, torque uh, compensation is done by the uh, two drive motors. And as I start to move forward, uh, basically the component of gyroscopic effect and self-generating lift is feeding in up to the transition area of 36 uh, to 43 kilometers when uh, the aircraft transitions into complete gyrocopter mode, which means complete passive uh, drive of the main rotor disc by, uh, by the wind. So um, the GT20 has an empty weight of around uh, 7.5 kilo, we said, and a maximum takeoff weight of 20 kilograms. So we have a payload of 12.5 kilogram. That sounds really a lot. Yes, I, I would think that uh, this is uh, for small UAVs um, almost state of the art. Um, it's, a, it's a very good value. Um, and um, the 7.5 kilo is first of all generated by a very light structure, a carbon frame monocoque uh, fuselage. Um, uh, we uh, are using uh, very strong pre-prac uh, manufactured parts for the wings and the tails and, and so on. We only have one drive motor. Um, when you compare it, for example, to a multicopter, you need at least four or six or eight, which uh, complicates the whole setup. You know, the, the other thing is that the 12.5 kilo weight allowance that we have, that we can split that into uh, the battery and uh, the actual load that I want to carry. And uh, this um, gave us the idea that we use um, a scalable battery. So um, we have from stock three different types, small, medium, and large battery uh, for different flight times. And depending on the size of the battery, I have a so-called weight allowance for my task load. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, with our smallest battery, um, the maximum uh, task load uh, for the drone is six and a half kilo. Mm -hmm. When I take my largest battery, you know, I still have a task load of three kilo available to, to me. When we carry, let me say, a um, sensor payload, uh, like a camera, 600, 700 grams, um, 
uh, which flight time uh, do we have then? So basically, when you use uh, a standard sensor like uh, you know an RGB camera combined uh, with an infrared camera, uh, you have uh, you know a task load between 500 and 700 grams. And if I choose my largest battery, which has 2.2 uh, kilowatt hours, um, my flight time is a little bit more than uh, two and a half hours. In that configuration, I'm also able to hover for one and a half hours on one place. So it's, it's a pretty significant flight time compared, for example, uh, to uh, multicopters. So um, let's talk about safety. This is, um, I guess, very important for, for everyone who's piloting a UAV. I do believe that, um, you know, all the questions around safety are fundamental to uh, the future use of UAVs anyway. Uh, because, um, you know, today, Small UAVs uh, operate in line of sight over a non-populated area with a very low risk prof profile. But you know, considering that this is not the standard mission, um, you know, we need to develop UAVs that have a complete different level of uh, safety features on board. Because you know, the regular mission that we are looking for in future is beyond visual line of sight, BV loss, as we say, over a highly densely populated area. Because you know, you want to get um, the blood probe from a hospital downtown Hamburg to a laboratory at, uh, at the airport. So you have no choice to fly over unpopulated area. Therefore, you know, safety features uh, is our main um, design principle uh, in the Gyrocopter GT20. Basically what you already have is, um, you know, we have two flight conditions, uh, which the drone can go back and forth with. So first of all, you have the what we call f fixed wing mode or, or wing mode. And the wing mode is the gyrocopter mode, non-driven uh, main rotor. And the beauty of that is in that mode, um, the helicopter is in auto rotation. It flies in auto rotation. Auto rotation is the mode where helicopters do emergency landings. So if we lose, for example, our traction motors, because the main motor is already switched off, we lose the traction motors, you know, we can commence an emergency landing without any transition. Now, when we go into our uh, helicopter mode or VTOL mode, um, you know, we operate like a helicopter and if we lose energy on the main motor or the battery, you know, then we transition into auto rotation and can do an emergency landing. The other feature that I do believe is uh, unique for this type of design is, you can see we have wings and we have a tail and um, the beauty of this uh, vehicle is that we have a very significant glide angle. Our glide angle is beyond 1 to 10, which means from an altitude of 200 meter above ground, I can still fly two kilometers without any power putting into the system. Besides uh, the redundant flight modes, I have redundant traction motors. The system is designed to operate on one traction motor only. The other thing uh, and most vulnerable uh, piece of equipment on board is always the battery. Our battery is built in blocks, so we have um, 12 serial cells to provide us with uh, 48 volts. Um, but you know, our smallest battery has nine blocks of that. Our medium size 12 blocks of that and the large 15 blocks of that. And we have an intelligent electronics on board for the battery management that if one block should go dead because one cell dies or one welding, uh, spot welding uh, breaks or so, then you know, the system will isolate that block and the remaining blocks will provide energy to fly. There is the unthinkable uh, incident that you lose all power from the battery because it gets um, disconnected from the main terminals. We have um, put an emergency battery into the system, which is a separate battery system, which is able to provide energy for five minutes for the servos and the autopilot. So even if you lose all motors, complete battery power, um, and partial power supply, this aircraft is still able to fly to its designated emergency landing spot, which is unique. Last but not least, um, 
everything else is redundant. So um, our autopilot uh, operates on multiple IMUs. We are using multiple magnetometers. Uh, we are using multiple GNNS uh, sensors and every other sensor like uh, acceleration, speed and so on is at least um, double redundant on board. Last but not least, we have a main board uh, which uh, provides all the power supplies. All the power supplies are redundant. 5 volt, 6 volt, 7.5 volt, 12 volt, 24 volt. And uh, there is a bus communication system on the main board, which is um, triple redundant on CAN bus. And then we have an RGB bus, a PWM bus, um, a Mavlink uh, 2 bus. Uh, so we have multiple communication systems. So even if one system fails, the drone is still able to operate. So, of course, it's uh, extremely important to avoid any critical situations. Um, how about a sense and avoid system? Yeah, this is something that um, uh, is another essential component uh, for small UAVs. Um, it is basically uh, which method do we choose to integrate ourselves into airspace management. It's complicated, you know, in a, in a, in a real aircraft, uh, you know, your sense part by definition of FAA and EASA is the pilot. Mm -hmm. And he looks out of the window and hopes that he he finds the obstacle that uh, is approaching. In UAVs, we don't have the luxury, so we need to measure and, and identify stuff and provide that information either to an operator on the ground who can take some action, or the drone itself needs to be intelligent enough um, to take action if there is a risk. And what we do, we are basically um, providing two potential systems which uh, the customer can, can choose from right now. One is uh, we are operating uh, with um, an autopilot military grade from Spain, from the company Invention, called Veronte. There is a version of the Veronte autopilot that has an ADSB in and out um, device. So ADSB out means the drone transmits its position, uh, speed, altitude, and flight vector to the outside world so that the drone can be seen by any aircraft or ground installation that has ADSB receivers. And the other thing is we have ADSB in, so we can basically um, receive the airspace picture. And the beauty of that is that our Veronta autopilot is able to identify an ADSB object that is in the same altitude on a collision path. And if it detects that this is happening, it will create a dynamic no-flight zone around that object and will avoid that object by um, an evasive uh, maneuver by itself. So it is completely autonomous. The other system that uh, we are integrating right now is from Dronik, um, a company that is owned by the Deutsche Flugsicherung and Deutsche Telekom. And uh, this device uh, basically provides um, uh, two sensors and, um, and a communication module. So it, uh, it has ADSB in. It has FLAM, which is pretty important because all low-level flying helicopters today carry FLAM as an identification aid. And uh, it also has uh, LTE communication to the ground. And uh, it creates for the operator on the ground um, a full picture of the airspace, which includes all ADSB signals, all FLAM signals, and the Deutsche Flugsicherung feeds in all the radar data that are available from airports and surveillance radars into this so that you have a complete picture. And then in this, uh, in this case, the ground operator can take decisions to avoid um, a collision risk. Could you please um, explain to us why the traditional UAV types like multicopter, helicopter, VTL, fixed wing were out of question for us? We as a company decided if, if we do a UAV, we want to expand the mission profile. So, you know, we, we basically decided that, um, you know, we wanted to, to have an aircraft that is capable in flying in adverse weather conditions, 
high wind speeds, um, rain, whatsoever, that has a um, pretty fast flying speed uh, in order to go from A to B in a foreseeable amount of time, provides a decent flight time, and then obviously it's all about payload. I mean, it doesn't matter if you fly three and a half hours if you can uh, only carry you know, a chewing gum of three gram uh, with you. You know, it doesn't make sense. So what is the big difference between, for example, first of all, multi-copter and a gyrocopter. The multi-copter has a natural limitation. So when you have your multi-copter, you typically have four motors on, on the edges of the airframe, which basically lift the payload and uh, also carry um, uh, the airframe itself. And you have to, all those four motors need to run all the time in order to keep this in the air, right? There's no um, normal generation of lift. It's all done by power. And um, so if you lose one motor on a quadcopter, you know, it does this. You cannot recover. It's impossible. The other disadvantage is when you want to move fast forward with a multicopter, you have to tilt um, the multicopter, right? Um, but as I said, you know, the lift generation is done by the four motors. Your lift vector when it hovers is straight up, right? But when you move forward, you need to tilt it. So your lift vector moves forward, which creates the forward moving force. But you need to still have the same lift. So you have to add energy, energy, energy to keep it in the air. And you can imagine if you have a tilt angle of 80 degrees like racing drones have, you know, they fly eight minutes. Why only this short time? Because all the energy that you need to keep it in the air is wasted energy. So according to our calculation, multicopters um, in transport can only reach a maximum forward speed of about 60 kilometers an hour. And that is already wasting energy. Um, and that was not our take. So the multicopter principle was not for us. Now, when you go to a V2L scenario, um, you have an aircraft um, with wings and, and you know, they are pretty efficient in, in forward flight at above a certain minimum speed, stall speed and, and higher. But you know, when you have uh, on a V2L aircraft, for example, when you lose all your V2L motors for whatever reason, you need a pretty piece, a big piece of land to land this, uh, this aircraft. So th the safety margin is, is limited. The other thing is that, that the lift capability to lift a whole aircraft, it needs a lot of energy in comparison to a helicopter, for example. And uh, that is the reason why V2Ls typically can only take off once, land once, and, and that's it. The, the last point against uh, V2L principle and you know, our CTO was an aircraft designer, so naturally he would design an aircraft, right? right? right. Uh, but he didn't uh, because, um, you know, aircrafts are, especially in VTOL mode, are very vulnerable to environment. So gusty wind condition is, is really poisonous for, for this type of aircraft. And then last but not least is, is the helicopter. And the difference of the helicopter to this is, although it looks similar, is in the helicopter, again, lift generation requires constant energy uh, into the main rotor. Whereas, you know, we at a certain speed, you know, use the apparent wind to rotate the rotor to generate lift, and that is much more energy efficient. So, so when you look at the whole envelope, um, the gyro track system from zero to about 26 meter per second forward speed is the most energy efficient UAV vehicle out there. And it's only beaten by one other system beyond that. So when you fly faster than 90 kilometers an hour, a VTUL is more energy efficient with all the disadvantages that it has on the front end with takeoff and landing and weather capabilities. So Joe, <clears throat> you already mentioned that the GT20 is uh, all weather capable. So uh, could you please explain a little more what that means? There are uh, two um, major principles for mission in bad weather. Um, you know, one is uh, the general principle of a helicopter. A helicopter is basically an all-weather aircraft. A gyrocopter is also an all-weather aircraft. That's the reason why in the Navy, frigates have helicopters on board mm -hmm. in order to uh, do search and rescue or, or fly, fly in bad weather. So we have a 
very high wind resistance. We believe that we can fly in 60 knots of wind safely and take off and land safely in 60 knots of winds. We are also pretty much certain that with the Veronto autopilot that we can land on moving objects like sea vessels up to wind force 10, even with the, with the moving platform. So that, that is um, pretty robust, I, I would say, and, and allows us to, to also fly missions in pretty adverse areas. The other thing is that from the design principle, all the electronics, um, everything that, that is in there, including the motors, um, is IP65 rated. So on top of, um, of the wind resistance, we can also fly in pouring rain. Now that we are coming to the end, uh, Joe, could you please um, summarize the hard facts about um, the GT20 for us? And so it's uh, basically developed, designed and manufactured in Europe uh, for the first uh, point. The gyro track uh, principle is scalable, so we can uh, generate aircraft from 4 kilogram uh, maximum takeoff weight up to 600 kilogram. The GT20 gyro track with uh, 20 kilogram maximum takeoff weight um, is in serial production as of now. Uh, the technical data are um, pretty simple. The maximum uh, speed is from zero kilometers an hour to 150 kilometers an hour. That is what we rate as the maximum speed. There is a little window between 36 and 43 kilometers. That's the transition zone. But basically, um, uh, we can take any speed. We have a flight time um, uh, of about a little bit more than one hour hovering, but a maximum flight time of uh, two and a half hours with uh, 700 gram payload. Our maximum task load is six and a half kilos. With uh, six and a half kilos, we can uh, still fly well over an hour. Our maximum altitude that we should be uh, capable of flying is 9,000 meter, 27,000 feet. All right, Joe, thank you for your um, explanations and uh, thank you for watching and um, have a good day.